Today, I come with a video I did not expect to make about a year ago. I mean, I did have my concerns about what was going to happen, but I still nonetheless couldn't be so disappointed by what has happened ever since. Because going back to the beginning of 2023 and at the end of 2022 with Puss in Boots The Last Wish seemed like they were entering a new creative era for DreamWorks after a period of hit or miss movies alongside Disney that had teetered back and forth and exploded in financial failures in their own 100th anniversary. One that I could have wished I cherished a decade ago in anticipation. Where what really turned up was something along the lines of the typical expectation of DreamWorks quality within the failure of Ruby Gilman and another mediocre Trolls film, the doomed syndicate debacle, and the disappointment of the OK Kung Fu Panda 4. Like looking at that slate after Puss in Boots, it really does not look good even if we compare the previous eras of the studio that could actually be worse. I mean, I know I didn't feature one other film that was released on Netflix, but I want to focus more on the theatrical releases and what has been covered to the public extensively here. I mean, in still regards to, to be fair with Megamind, that is still done mostly by their television department that still counts as that, but it is called DreamWorks nonetheless and still released under their brand under the entire universal arm of Comcast. For despite everyone knowing for the most part that I am a major Disney fan and will always love them no matter how much crap they want to produce to change them for the better, I also do enjoy when when DreamWorks does good as a competitor for what stories that they are known for, excited at its potential but disappointed by its output. A problem we have to really discuss today, while concerning its future with upcoming films like The Wild Robot that should be good, coming from the talent of Chris Sanders who also made Lilo and Stitch, worked on The Lion King, and co-directed How to Train Your Dragon and then on that I personally love. Because even while that seems promising, I still held some of the same excitement for films like Kung Fu Panda 4 where it just recently turned out below expectations in so many regards. Like I said, I don't hate this particular film, but it doesn't really match the heights of the previous trilogy really well and is in fact the worst Kung Fu Panda film to date by so far. That it adds less from the rest and misunderstands the impact it had as a franchise from the start even if it can be good enough with family but nothing more than that. Where we have to go back to the beginning to show this problem. Where you look at the slate before 2022 with films like Bad Guys, it really wasn't the greatest for that studio at all as for the most case during the pandemic era. I mean, for the most part, the films were just sequels like the recent films released before 2020 like Trolls and Boss Baby and others that came along the way like Spirit Untamed, which sadly became an unnecessary sequel that performed badly at the box office both critically and financially. Where it just wasn't great decisions for the studio regardless, where I really forgot some of them even existed until I decided to make videos surrounding them just this last year. They just weren't very good films at all and only were being watched at home by the time it was released. Except of course maybe The Crudes that was pretty decent on its own for a sequel. But regardless of that, for what most people knew about DreamWorks at the time, it was just generally something that was negative in reception, like people didn't care, doing properties that some of us do regard as their worst to date, with a few years after their original predecessors came out in between, a few other films like How to Train Your Dragon's final sequel and the abominable film that was co-produced by their Pearl Studio. So when films like The Bad Guys actually came out in 2022, things started to change in perception to become more positive once again. Having a movie that's based on a style of animation similar to the Spider-Verse in some way, where they actually stated it was based on that, including having its composer in Daniel Pemberton. It was a breath of fresh air at the time even though it wasn't just quite a huge yet. A modest success with a style that was being adopted by others like Sony and now DreamWorks within their next production being Puss in Boots The Last Wish. A film that of course needs no introduction. And this is a film that started the grand new hope for the studio, for something that didn't open big at the time since Avatar also came out, but constantly rode throughout the entire weeks. Where the film was just absolutely tremendous and word of mouth spread throughout to see this movie that was really worth the hype. I mean, I don't think I need to tell you the whole story since we've covered it so many times in the past, but just highlighting the main points of how this was the combination of great animation, great story, great music, and great characters that made this film work so well similar to the past with other films like Shrek 2 in DreamWorks Golden Age. Looking back upon it two years now, I still believe that this film was just that good being one of the few that is way better than their own predecessors that had such a strong resonating message. Where it also came at a time that Disney and Pixar wasn't doing too hot with their own grand return to theaters, with both Lightyear and Strange World being complete box office bombs back in 2022, where they just weren't good enough anymore despite its own recent streaming success with other films like Encanto and Turning Red in some way. A studio that was just in the midst of change with executives in a scramble to fix before the big century was going to happen, which wasn't looking too good at all. Where many people online just turned to that opinion, pushing for the next big release by the same time frame with the rise of the familiar age-old argument of Disney versus DreamWorks, that of course has happened since their very birth. 
birth formed by the man who used to work for the former company and spearheaded the rise of the Disney Renaissance in some way. Where it did make sense to why it had to be revived at the time, since such a film like that included things that Disney would not do at all, like villains. Where it wasn't just one, but also three distinct villains in a single story, while the other just really didn't even do any at all for their couple years at that point. But also how things were just taken out of context for the history and forgotten memory of the inconsistency that they would harbor with another trailer for a film like Ruby Gilman would come out. One that showed for most who had seen the trailer were quick to compare it to the upcoming live action remake of The Little Mermaid that was getting mixed reactions for the obvious reasons. For applying that logic, the first thing you would do is to compare this movie as a parody striking at Disney with a redhead who is popular who is also a mermaid who is actually bad compared to the Kraken teenager who is the main protagonist. A flip script that DreamWorks was known for to be good at with mentioning Shrek and what Puss in Boots did with some of its characters that referenced that era of children's stories. Where the problem with this was the fact that this new movie was hyped on by some on the internet as the next big win in the eternal Disney vs DreamWorks argument of one studio making animated movies that people want to see versus the studio and the overall company making constant remakes and films that don't have good stories anymore rather than short messages. And I'm not saying everyone was like this because there were so many who were concerned about the film where it just was the image to how it was portrayed during that season online coming off a of grand success of what was released in Puss in Boots that was just too good of a movie that you just had to trust that this is the new era that they were going to take things, taking things seriously while the other studio was not doing so, and how others like myself were actually concerned that this film was going to be generic and not good as you probably thought it would be, where you already got what you know from the trailers and nothing else was added unless it was going to twist something to be very different and more emotional alongside the parody aspect that they were known for. That what would be revealed was to be expected and nothing interesting is to be seen. Where sadly, most people who did went to theaters around those months did forgot or wasn't interested in seeing that movie at all, resulting in one of DreamWorks' worst box office bombs in the modern era, not even making back its $70 million budget by the end of its run. A huge disaster that didn't know how to actually market itself correctly to an audience interested in other works at the time like the actual Little Mermaid remake and the Spider-Verse animation that was released during the same time frame, as well as Elemental that didn't also open up well but was enjoyable enough to where more people decided to see it. And watching this film for the first time, it actually was more predictable than what was shown, never attempting to do anything unique with its twists, and never really wanting to dive in its interesting questions or depths that most of these stories would usually have. A movie that I just don't really have much to cover on because it seems like Universal themselves never cared for that except for what else was releasing at the same time during the same season that was justified by online reactions to some extent to the opportunity to bash Disney for their old stick. Now again, I'm not saying that was the entire reaction, but that was the gist of this film that was named Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken and what you see the hero and the villain should normally see, and how it did nothing else beyond those two concepts. But regardless of what happened with Ruby Gilman, and because most of us knew that DreamWorks was inconsistent as a studio, I think most of us still kept up hope for the future as I've mentioned many times because they have produced such great quality sequels in the past, mentioning just Puss in Boots from before alongside Shrek, How to Train Your Dragon, Kung Fu Panda, and so on, that these films are beloved today even as sequels and honestly we should still expect good things to come from them. Where they would also go back to the typical schedule of films that weren't my cup of tea anymore alongside the average by the book performance with a film like Trolls 3. Now I say this because I did not see it nor did I plan to see it because it didn't interest me and continued as a franchise I didn't think that was best to do but still understood why they did it for the studio's usage of pop music. I have to be honest about this because I also understand many people already feel the same way thinking that this is a decent watch for what Trolls is not being the best that the studio could produce and the continuation of a familiar formula that most actually love. Needed of course after the earlier stint with Ruby Gilman and continued the sequel trend that they have done released before. Where of course the next major film would be Kung Fu Panda 4 that really highlighted the sequel strategy. And I did have high hopes for this knowing that the potential of the franchise was really great wanting to see where it comes next as an extent and the plan they had from before to make it a 6 part or 8 part film franchise. That if you had the quality of Puss in Boots that we have mentioned for the billionth time in the row, then we should expect great things from this movie as they have put care into the message and the story of Poe. Well, of course that was the hope before the news came out that Megamind was officially getting a sequel that stunned everyone in the worst possible way. Because before that announcement, I generally knew at the time a series based upon Megamind was in the works that would be geared for a younger audience and thought nothing else about it. That I guess it would be fine for what they were doing since I personally thought that the franchise never needed another movie continuation or a sequel where it was just something I did not want to see. And I still have not fully seen it to date because of how bad it looked and it was being lumped 
lambasted by the internet, that it went full circle back to the time that Disney made their own directed DVDs and pilots for their own television shows with crap animation, where this film was making one for streaming by DreamWorks Animation Television. Where the reality is with this regard is the fact that it shouldn't apply to DreamWorks just like how Disney Toon was different from Walt Disney Animation, but how it still has to be considered in this video for the major problems because of what was to expect it in the reputation it has already built. That even if it has become a major cult classic that many of us actually enjoy, it was just too little too late to do so for a franchise that doesn't even need to continue to exist. Like before such a news existed, the question just had to be asked how do you actually continue something that had a great conclusive ending? What else can you do with Megamind after he discovered his true place in life other than a series? Well, the answer was to make it in fact a series, but also a movie that butchers plenty of things about the original in terms of its characters and its story. Like this was the major reason I wanted to create this entire video because it completely busted the narrative of the DreamWorks comeback that most of us believed at the start of last year, including myself as a major Disney fan. Because this doesn't just have anything in regards to what most people loved about Megamind at all. The villains don't work and the hero doesn't work at all in an aftermath that was meant to show he was his own individual where a hero could arise from just about anywhere. And how you don't have the same structure with the original cast not returning and the animation downgraded to extreme level like a series only meant for preschoolers and no one else. All of which just doesn't make sense since most people who have loved it are way older now compared to whom they actually want to target for in the series for the sake of adding content to their main streaming platform. Which was the main purpose of its existence to promote one of the endless crap streaming services like Peacock. Because I really can't think of anything else more limiting than doing something like that, especially for something as beloved as Megamind as a property that does deserve better. Which technically just meant to leave it as B and the button of doom completely alone. Because if you saw the ending of this thing, then you definitely know how that also butchers a lot of his character alone and how it was only used because they needed the series to exist and nothing else. Nothing important to say since we already need a familiar story to use in the modern sense of corporate media. Where even while you had the returning writers, it seems like nobody who actually worked on that project understand every single plot point of Megamind that existed in the first place. Removing things or adding things that don't make sense like Minion into Old Chum. Which unfortunately because of that, it all leads us to Kung Fu Panda 4 as another disappointment to end things on. One that isn't still a bad film by any means and it's still an actual decent watch regardless that is harmless, but it is still one that also fails to match what Kung Fu Panda was good at doing with its story. That its characters from Poe and its villain in Chameleon just didn't feel like it was impactful at all with its message, even with the usage of past villains like Tai Long and only featuring Shen and Kai as visual cameos and mentioning the Furious Five in name only. Where it's a film that moves at a rapid pace to get to the point that they needed this film to exist rather than legitimizing its importance to continue in that journey that began with the first film. Like we have just said from before, this is the weakest film in the franchise and it shows, where it really does not want to delve into the connection that Poe has with the world that he constantly learns from or the consequences that he faces from a villain that has a legitimate threatening presence committing heinous actions that confirm such. Just feels like they were aiming for the necessity of having a movie out at a certain time rather than committing to a meaningful start of a perceived second trilogy, making it seem less necessary to even exist or add on to all. Where it confirms that the third film completed his entire arc in a way as a dragon warrior and just haphazardly moving on to the next one completing another journey similar to Uglay, which of course does have potential to explore in its output, but how it never felt like that even mattered at all since it's performed at a rushed pace. These highlighted films, although consistent with the inconsistency that DreamWorks has been known for, point out a major problem that the studio has been dealing with in terms of their stories that is just hard to ignore at this point. That for every film they make that can be regarded as a masterpiece like Puss in Boots, comes an entire plethora of mediocre stinkers in between, with newer ones added for the newer services like Megamind becoming heaping piles of trash. Where we have entered this new era that is turning for the worse with productions like that for their own sequels that makes us worry about their original films that haven't quite done so well at the box office. I mean, this doesn't mean the end of things or that things can be forgotten especially for those specific releases, but it just shows an overall lacking interest for such ideas that made us love them compared to the past, not really ending for the better. But regardless of me saying all this, we should still go in newer films with a positive open mind with their upcoming slate of films released to theaters, still expecting that they still have great quality within them because they still do. Saying all of that because DreamWorks also did do things like quietly release a film on Netflix known as Orion and the Dark, which I wanted to separate in this video to talk more
more on their familiar properties either being released in theaters or heavily covered to not tag it along since it was on Netflix compared to Universal's own Peacock and so forth, where sometimes we should and shouldn't expect this to continue if more should be seen by them, and how they need to fix that if they were to still continue on, and hope that they still succeed in doing so. And I'm all done, so goodbye.